the first meeting of the Chagrin Falls Board of Education. I was watching the... Uh, Ms. Luca, would you please take a call? Mr. Garvey? Yes. Mr. Rankin? Yes. Mrs. Rose? Yes. Mr. Kensinger? Yes. Here. Mrs. O'Toole? Yes. Here. Please join me as we stand and face the flag for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. So this is the point in our meeting where we invite public comment. If there's anyone here tonight who would like to say something to the board or speak with the board, then I have a few guidelines to share with you. If you could just indicate that you would like to make a comment. Okay, seeing none, we'll just proceed to the next item on the agenda, which is board reports. At this time, we share our board committee updates. As I run through each of the board committees, if the committee that you represent has not met since our last meeting or you have no new updates, just say no report. The audit committee, this is O'Toole. Policy Committee, Mrs. Bros. The Business Advisory Committee, Mr. Rankin. Not met, but we will tomorrow morning. Okay. The Capital Planning Committee is me, and I have no report. The Board Finance and Budget Committee, Mr. Rankin. Uh, we met last night. I uh, introduced some new members into the committee. Uh, we will get to know you, and then basically are looking through the uh, approved our charter or reviewed our charter. And then uh, review the financial package that we get on a regular monthly basis. We will do that. So our next meeting for July 8th in this room at 6 o'clock. If you want to board me the charter, I'll add it to my Yep. Records retention, there's no report tonight. The superintendent's report. At this point, I'll turn the meeting over to Mr. Hunt for the superintendent's report. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Uh, first report this evening is a, a recognition of a, a tremendous program that we have in our school and our community. Uh, if you don't know, on April 22nd, 2019, Mayor Tom Coe declared May 1st, uh, which is today, um, school crossing of our day in And um, we wanted to just take a moment this evening to recognize um, the other individuals that are consistently out there helping and supporting our uh, young people. Um, obviously, their, their responsibilities include being visible and recognizable, hopefully slowing traffic down along the way, uh, providing for presence for walkers and bikers along the way, and obviously stepping out in, in, in the street from the traffic <laughs> sometimes to slow people down so our students see the cross. I think that the piece that may, may be missing in all of this is every time you have an adult that's consistently somewhere that interacts with young people, it's an opportunity for um, assistance in the growth and the development of that young person. And those daily day interactions, whether it's a simple hello or a pat on the back, go a long, long way. And we, we know in research, uh, when students are connected to adults in their community, they're more likely to be successful. So I don't want to minimize what they do from a function standpoint, but when I look at the benefits of the program, I would say that that is one of the greatest benefits. So thank you for being there for our young people to protect them interact with them and develop a relationship with them. I know Mrs. Harvey also has a comments well. Right, I just wanted to thank you. All the crossing guards are volunteers, and um, there are five corners, I think, that are being covered this year on a regular basis, so every morning and every afternoon, and the main intersections where our students are crossing. Um, so just want to thank you for your service. I know that every day you're out there, you know that you're making a difference. Um, it's one of the most rewarding things um, that I know I do. I still do two shows a week, and, and I love it. It makes my day when I do it. So um, I'm going to read your name, and if we're going to have everybody come up at one time so we can get a photograph, and then we do have a certificate for you. And after we're done with that, we'd like to invite all the family members and the audience here to enjoy some cake and punch, um, and we'll take a five-minute recess. So as I call your name, if you'll please come up. First and foremost, very importantly, is our crossing guard manager, who is Sandy Top. I'll give these to you all later. If you'll line up in front of the table, I think that would be the best thing. Deborah Blair, I think, could not be here tonight. Paul Brandt also told me he couldn't be here tonight. Eva Bros, I'll just give it to you, Sharon. Um, Jen Condon, Jen, yeah. Rebecca Haas, 
also could be here. Just the first few. We've got a good group here. Ellen Herman. There she is. Addie Holdren. Judy Lawrence. Case out of it. Her fault. Um, that's what we're going to be 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
working with both organizations to understand their structure, their needs, and their desires. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to steal this thumb there, I'm going to let them share with you the work. So you have two attachments from the board perspective. You've got the PowerPoint that will be delivered, and you also have an executive, executive summary that they uh, put together that summarizes everything. So uh, without further ado, let's take part. All right, thank you for giving me a few minutes tonight to go over what I've been doing the last four or five months uh, with the Youth Sports Project. Um, sorry, oh. would you mind sitting on this side? On this we, side? Yeah, okay. we started videotaping our okay. meetings. No problem. They came no problem. See the um, I'm going to briefly touch on why we started the project, maybe a little history of both organizations, what we learned, and then where we are, where we are right now with the project moving forward. Um, Bob touched a little bit on uh, the district. He was approached last year by CSA. Um, to see if there was sort of in, an interest with the school to take over uh, the youth sports in this community. Bob then reached out to the leadership of CAA and, uh, and asked them if they were interested. They were at least interested in sitting down and discussing some of the merits of uh, a partnership. Um, and whatever we found out, the direction was going to be determined by the by the study, we, we weren't, we didn't have any any preconceived notions on where it was going to go, what was going to happen. Um, although when I went through my uh, the process, I did actually I looked at it with the idea of we were going to take them over because I felt it would be easier to backtrack if it didn't work or there would be parts of it that weren't going to work. So that's kind of how I approached it. So. Uh, I started out by meeting with the, the leaders of both organizations to see to gauge their interest in a partnership. Um, if they had any non-negotiable items, that if, if they were going to come under the umbrella of the school, or if they had some uh, certain ideas on how they envisioned it looking, if they if everybody came together under the under the school's umbrella, um, I think an important part of this whole, at least when I, I learned about it, was the history um, of both organizations play a big part of this study. Um, both organizations, I really think, are really ingrained in the, our community. CAA was started in formally in the early 70s, by 1972. Uh, CSA was formed in the late 70s under CAA's watch, and then they went on their own. Um, but the, if, if you think about <coughs> children back in, in that day, or children now, Almost, I would bet most of the kids in this community probably have played some sort of sport at some time under one of those organizations. So I think there certainly is a, uh, a lot of history with both groups. Um, one of the things that I did do was I wanted to look at other communities to see how they would run their youth sports. So we looked uh, locally, we looked at schools like Aurora, Kenston, Chardon, West Jug, Orange, to kind of get an idea of what they do. Uh, regionally, we looked at uh, Rocky River and then we went down to Bexley and uh, Indian Hills, kind of similar schools, to kind of to see if there was any similarities with what they do with their youth sports, if we could take some of what they do, use it as a model moving forward. What I found out was most of the other communities, uh, they are rec, city-run rec programs that already have large staffs in place. Um, some of them were financed through levies, uh, taxing agents. Every once in a while, you'll find somebody that a, a community that had, like baseball, will have their organ, their own organizations, completely separate from football uh, or baseball. So there really wasn't anybody that had the same setup that we do here. We're very unique in the fact that we've got uh, two organizations that are self-funded and they are volunteer. They run by volunteers for the most part. Um, the next thing I, look, I took a look at was their mission statements because if they were going to come under, uh, they were going to have an association with the school, obviously we feel that their, uh, how they run their organizations, their mission needs to coincide with what the school stands for. Um, I will say this, both, both groups, all they have is the best interests of the kids at their heart. And, and they, both of them, they, they talk about sportsmanship, leadership, um, all the things that you want your children to strive for, they just use sports as an avenue to get there. They're both well-run organizations. Um, they both have, like I said, they have the best interests of the kids at heart. Um, obviously, every, they're doing it through different uh, avenues with the different sports, but that's their mission statement, I think, really coincides with the school district as well. Um, 
their organization and structure is basically everything they do is is geared towards what their mission statement is. Uh, CAA has an 11 member board, uh, president, vice president, secretary. Every one of their different sports has a commissioner that's on the board. Uh, CSA is same thing. They have an eight member board, uh, president, vice president, secretary, treasurer. Uh, however, they do have an, an actually paid administrator on their staff um, uh, that does all their scheduling and, and a lot of administrative work that, uh, that CA does not have. So uh, CSA actually pays one of their employees. Do you, uh, can yeah. you just remind me of the sports that fall under CAA? Uh, sure. Uh, so, well, CAA is, uh, they have nine sports, boys and girls basketball, boys and girls across. Um, they have uh, wrestling, golf, baseball, softball. Yeah, that's what, that's under their umbrella. Uh, the, and CSA obviously just does soccer. Uh, how, how many years has CSA been paying because uh, when I, I had to volunteer, no, I... Uh, it was, they have been paying somebody, when we did our financial summary, with, yeah. which is the next one, they, I went about five years back and they started, they were paying somebody um, basically about five, four, four or five years ago that they started to pay some year. So uh, getting to the financial summary, so what I did is I looked at, um, I looked at each group's revenues, their expenses, uh, a history of about four or five years, kind of get a feel for if they were stable, if they were solvent, if they were running on a, a shoestring. I can say that both organizations are on solid financial ground. Um, they both have uh, a significant cash balance if they needed to uh, make any major purchases. Uh, so they, and, you know, they, every, you know, every once in a while you'll have a one year that they may lose money, but that's because they had to they had to buy more equipment, uniform turnover, or something like that. But for the most part, uh, all of them are, are on financial solid ground. Neither one of them spends frivolously at all. Uh, they, they really look, watch out for their money. Um, and you know, they, they're not in any kind of uh, situation where they would have to fundraise to keep their operation going forward. Um, then we kind of we get into the, just the current operations of the, of their, of each group, um, and basically the one thing that I that I wanted to uh, talk about was their enrollment numbers and their uh, the trends moving forward. So um, enrollment, as far as your enrollment enrollment goes, CSA has about 300 kids that play soccer. They offer both rec and travel soccer. Um, their rec program they pay uh, $100 and they get to play in the fall and the spring. Their travel program is actually run by an outside organization for sports, if anybody's familiar with it. They pay about $575 um, the, for their travel program. Force actually does all the coaching and training for them on the, on, for CSA. Uh, of those 300 kids that play uh, rep, about 185 of them play travel uh, in soccer. Uh, CA, on the other hand, they have about 700 kids that are enrolled. Uh, those sports range anywhere in the rec program from say $90 to $120, depending on the sport. Um, they're, they probably have about another 100 kids that also uh, play a travel sport, and those the fees for those will depend on the sport. Uh, you know, with how many tournaments the coaches are going to take their kids to, how many practices they're going to have it during the off season. But it, again. It runs anywhere between 400 and sometimes the baseball travel, depending on where they're going, can you know, range up to six, 650 um, for those guys. But the uh, the, tr the trends moving forward, the, the, uh, the leadership of CSA is saying that they expect the numbers to stay consistent going forward. Uh, CSA, with all their, their sports, are different. They're, uh, main sports that have a lot of numbers that they that have been consistent up and down the line and will continue to be consistent are basketball, lacrosse, and the early, the younger stages of baseball, t-ball, coaches, things like that. Um, their golf program and their wrestling program have small numbers, but they certainly are consistent. And every once in a while, they'll have a, a spike in a year where there's more kids they want to get involved with it. Their golf program they actually just started a few years ago, so they, that's just kind of getting off the ground. Um, the one sport that is showing a decrease in uh, participation is football. 
Um, not to bore you with the details, but they, they only have, I think, one team this, this past year. They've had as many as five in the past. A lot of kids now are playing, uh, playing flag football. And uh, it is not just a shooting falls issue. There's a lot of communities, even like major football communities, Aurora being one of them, that they're, they are seeing a big decrease in the number of kids that are playing tackle football. Um, do you think that's um, I, I mean, I would guess it's the, the concussion here. I mean, that's probably the biggest thing. I know about three or four years ago, CA used to have five football teams, and now this past year they have one. Aurora was in a similar boat. They may have had two, but they have more kids to rock on the woods. But it's kind of, it seems to be one of the big, in any of the, uh, in any of the articles you read, that, you know, some of the uh, medical professions try to keep kids off playing tackle football until they get a little older. So I think maybe the fear factor from the parents that has, has part of that, that you know, probably plays into that. Dave, is that an active conversation with CAA about flag versus tackle? Or? Uh, well, that's part of the growth potential they have discussed it. Um, Coach I. Marino has also kind of asked them if they would consider it. Um, uh, that's absolutely something that they would uh, be interested in. It's a, it's a way that they could grow their numbers if they wanted to. Currently, a lot of the kids go and play flag football at Kenston, and that's where they get their football. You know, if they're not going to play tackle, they will play flag football at, at uh, Kenston, but they are registering through the Kenston's. Uh, Kenston yeah. runs chagrin teams. Yes. Fly. Yes, exactly. Um, so, but it is something that, that CA has, has discussed on whether they can get, you know, have enough kids to at least form a team under our register, under their registration, send them to Kenton or whatever league they would play and play some flag football. Um, the other area of growth for uh, CA is um, that they've discussed is, is cheerleading. It would obviously target a different market that they have never, never, never targeted. Um, it's also the they bought, they get, uh, people come to them a lot and say, well, why aren't you offering, you know, volleyball, why aren't you offering this? Well, a lot of it is because of the facilities, you know, the, the, the uh, facilities that they just don't have access to a lot of times, um, especially inside facilities. Surely it wouldn't be something that would necessarily take a, a big facility for them to find spots the to do it. So it's something that they have kicked around in the, you know, in the past. Uh, CSA has told me that they are looking to increase their numbers as well by, and obviously soccer is a sport that is conducive to playing at a younger level, so they would even talk about going younger and having, you know, maybe limited training sessions for their younger kids to try to get involved earlier, um, so that they believe that they could actually um, increase their numbers moving forward as well. Dave, sorry to interrupt. Oh, sure. Um, with regard to the fees that uh, parents are charged, mm -hmm. are we comparable to other Districts, or is that a fair thing to ask? Uh, I mean, it, we're, we're comparable. To, I mean, CSAs, uh, they actually have a very good deal with $100 for basically two seasons. And uh, that, that's that's a very good deal. Um, CA is, you know, most of their rec programs fall under the, the same, you know, a, a consistent, uh, if you compare it to other schools, it's the it's, uh, same, very, very similar. I did not get into the like the, the rec program or the travel programs in those other districts. They were basically so big and you know it just every every year they get a new uniform. Every, so I don't we have no idea how much they were charging them for their travel programs because some of them were, were associated with the third party and we just had, we didn't have access to that. I guess part of where that would lead is would there be a cost savings to a parent if there was some consolidation of these organizations? Well, to a parent. Potentially, we're not. We haven't gone down that road yet. I mean, how it would be. I think that the this the savings to a parent, I think, is going to be more of the hopefully, if we if we can do this, to be able to open up some more facilities that they could practice here, maybe in off seasons, rather than having to drive 30 minutes to practice at a different facility. Um, that would that would help save the organization some money, and maybe that you know it would keep the cost from increasing down the line. Obviously, they're probably not going to reduce their costs, but it certainly would maybe limit their costs moving forward. Um, what hinders them from using our facilities now? Well, nothing hinders them from using our facilities in season, but the policy has been that if it was an option, like say, if they say a baseball team wants to start practicing in February, and they would ask to use the gym, 
uh, that was something that in the past we have not allowed them to have access to. Um, if we do, would go down this road, it would be something that I think that would be beneficial to both organizations and to the school. I mean, uh, CAA has specifically told me that they would rather, rather than pay $60 to rent a, a gymnasium somewhere, they would rather pay the $41 or $42 that they pay for the school um, to get their kids to have to, you know, just drive five minutes, not, you know, not have to drive all the way out to somewhere else to do it. But that's kind of been the, the, the reason why it hasn't been offered to them in the past. Now, they get offered facilities in season. You know, basketball gets to whatever gym, gym, gym time is left um, after the school teams get done. But they're, uh, they, they, they're worried about opening up a can of worms, like who's going to, you know, who's going to start asking for it then under CAA. But, my thought as we go as we go forward, um, it'd be that if you had somebody in the school and say, listen, this is what you have, you can divide it up amongst your own teams what how you want. So here's your time, here's your time, split the time between the two groups and then they can organize it how they want rather than a CA baseball coach calling up like a saying, we have a gym or or a CA lacrosse coach saying, we have the gym. Is that something you essentially recommend? even if we don't have a consolidation yes. and an improvement yeah. to access mm -hmm. to our facility. Absolutely. Just, so I know they both are, they both pay administrators. CSA pays coaches at the floor for yes. the addition to the space. The CAA have any sports they've been in the professional coaches? They've, they've paid, I would say, it's, I would say it's never, it's not never happened, I mean, because they do, like they have paid, like girls basketball, I think once they brought in a coach, they didn't have a whole lot of girls, okay. so they paid somebody to run a run some programs for them. Um, they were like people from from Chagrin. It wasn't like a, an outside professional. Um, but they see it as 99% all volunteer. Um, one of the things once we got done towards the end of the uh, uh, report, the one thing that we learned was the fact that both organizations want to keep their autonomy. Um, they worked really hard to develop what they have right now and they don't want to give that up. Uh, but they do see the benefit of collaborating together to find some common ground, and they understand that the, there are benefits of partnering with the school um, moving forward that can help their organization. So I think they're both willing to uh, to go down that road. They're just not willing to hand over the keys to the school and say, "Here you go, you know, we're we're out." Because both of them are sold or solid, fundamentally sound programs right now. Um, so it gets us to where the rec our recommendations and where we where we stand right now. Um, one of the main things that both organizations talked about is they would like to have the school to help them out, maybe some registration help, um, some marketing help. Uh, right now, everybody kind of has their own, they have their own website, and they're, they're people maybe not, if you're from the village, you understand where to go, but if you're a new family, you may not understand, you may not know where to go. Uh, what we're trying to do is maybe get you know, a single onboarding point on the school's website where people do know they go to you know, Chagrin Youth Sports, they, should, they hit the link, there's CA, CSA, um, that's you know, right there for them, and then they can just, they can click and go in and do their registrations. Right now what we're doing is we are uh, going down the road of talking with somebody on whether the school can, can handle all their registrations or do they still want to have uh, do the registrations themselves. Um, it's just it's something that we just started walk, going down that road just recently. Um, um, yeah. Sure. I'm wondering, thinking about this now, if the school partners with this, would we have Title IX implications? Because I mean, there's a lot more boys sports than girls. I don't know that. Um, you know, Sports, and I know, you know some of these districts we've looked at are running this through the education department. Um, one of the things I would say is they've brought uh, uh, Lauren into their part in the conversation uh, as well. Is that to see where, where these pieces, if we were to move forward, where would they fit within our organization? Again, but that's, those are conversations we are just kind of starting to have. So we're not going to see recommendations in that day take on any one of these pieces and just kind of shining a light on where we see some opportunities for potential synergy and we'll continue with the next steps.
the next besides the marketing and uh, registration that they've, they've asked about, they, they're, uh, they're interested in a single point of contact at the school. So if it was a registration question, we envision that being a community ed, uh, somebody would go to the community ed. If it was anything operation-wise amongst the sports, they would come to the athletic department. And as you know, the athletic department, whoever's in, in charge of that, could handle things like scheduling, uh, mediation. If there's any conflict between the two groups, on you know, you know, boy, we, we should have this you know field, we should have this gym, and you know, that point of contact, and kind of get and say, hey, you know, kind of uh, ease the feathers there. Um, the one thing that both groups were interested in was a standardized code of conduct that players, coaches, and parents would have to follow. Um, that's something that we're, we would like to develop um, so everybody would be under the same you know, rules, regulations, on how we expect people to act. Um, honestly, well, it's probably not the kids, it's probably one of the adults anyways, but at that level. But um, it's just something rather than CA, CSA having their own code of conduct, CA having their, their own code of conduct, have one code of conduct that covers everybody. Um, coaching standards right now, uh, CA, CA, their coaches are required to pass them or take the Lindsay's Law, their, uh, the concussion test will have a return to play. Um, they do have a code of conduct that they're supposed to follow. Sa the same with CSA. Uh, they, they have to do the same thing. Now, the travel coaches obviously in CSA are from the force. Uh, they're, not, they're not volunteers. Um, so we would like to make sure that we had a standardized uh, code of conduct and uh, for the coaches, and also maybe get them involved a little bit with our uh, positive coaching alliance, which is, I think, a tremendous thing for everybody to kind of get an idea of you know, what what they should what they should if they're going to coach young children, what how they should act, you know, what their job should be. It should not be about trying to get wins and losses. It should be about developing kids to the best of their ability. And then the last thing is maybe combining some resources. You know, uh, if there's any potential savings with each group. Of, uh, whether it's insurance, storage, um, we talked about the facility, open up the facilities more that they can rent our facility rather than rent somewhere else with a lot more money. So just so certain things like that that would help them uh, possibly save some money. Um, it, I, you've asked some questions to John, but if anybody has any more, we have to answer some right now. So both organizations you know, heard, heard your recommendations? Or, uh, yeah, uh, well, that the, it's, the recommendations are, uh, are or have come about by just you know, sitting down and talking with them, and these are the ones that we've kind of agreed as a group that where we would probably need to start initially uh, through this process. So they, so they're everybody kind of that they're sharing ideas about code of conduct, about marketing, about websites, about things like that. So everybody's on the same page. We organize them. Do we have enough facilities to service all the programs they have? People didn't have to drive. Their yeah. I mean, if it, I mean, CSA uses force. CA. I mean, even in the if, if just taking the winter, for instance. I mean, the fall is not as I mean, any of the outside stuff is usually not as bad because there's a, at least more uh, options. The in, it's the inside stuff. It's uh, basketball. I mean, in the winter time they get. You know, we've run into. Uh, they've run. CA's run a community meeting before. They were out at Family Life Center. Uh, you know, obviously we're down at the gymnasium the last couple of years, uh, but they're at the mercy of the, the, the school teams, the school practices and things like that. But it could help alleviate at least some of it um, moving forward. No question, uh, fields in terms of just uh, access and availability of fields and I guess quality, is that the you know, way you describe it or uh, kind of the standard? Probably the field. Yeah. Quality of the fields and just the number of spaces, and just the amount of spaces to accommodate. Now, I can tell you that's not a new problem, but you know, identifying that we had blocked off kind of standard blacked off, blocked off space allows for a really good conversation about you know, there is opportunity there where we could open something up. And you know, that's that's something that I think you know, we're more open to and more to do. Um, it's not going to resolve the issue. The issue is still going to be there, uh, but it helps, I think, offset some of the work that we're having outside. Uh,
So I, I, I think I think with this, um, and I don't, I'm not looking for approval or recommending for that not. Um, full consolidation is an extreme, um, and I think we very quickly realized there was an interest in autonomy and that they're doing a really good job of financially stable. But sitting at the table and having a little bit of conversations led us to think there's a, there's a few real opportunities that could be considered as first steps. And some of what they've talked about would be quite a resource on our part. If we're having someone as their single point of entry, that's going to be a resource application. So that's a further conversation. And maybe the next step of this is to further those conversations. What I'm committed to is that we're not, we're not implementing anything until we communicate back. But these are things we're, we're interested in continuing the conversation and taking the next step away. So they allocate in their expenses currently each for, an, for administrative assistance. I, I think CAA just CSA. 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 CAA. 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 Except they're paying your head. Are you anticipating it? Yeah. 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 Personnel. Or is it going to be absorbed within the department? I'm, I'm saying one of the areas that they expressed an interest in is that. And to do that, there's going to be a personnel commitment of the time. And I would envision either to the athletic department and or community education. It's a matter of, okay, what does that actually look like? What are your expectations of that? How much time will cost? And then you know, taking that next step and saying, okay, this does make sense. That's the conversation we bring back to you and say, here's, here's what this looks like now is the, the next step. Um, some of this, you know, we are we're working on scheduling a, a meeting where we're, where they're all in the room and working with us. So it's a consolidation opportunity there. We sent off the insurance policy to ensure is there is there an opportunity here where we kind of you know, approach you as a, as a larger entity, if you will, uh, is there an opportunity for cost savings? Some of this we can work, move forward with not you know, not a lot of cost, but items that will um, drain our resources or pressure our resources and kind of help us look at that next like financially. Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. My presentation will be riveting. Um, and make kind of begin to develop our master schedules in the building. Um, in 
it's very important to, to realize or understand that elementary scheduling is very different, different than secondary scheduling. Um, and our even our four through six is a bit unique in terms of what we offer and how we schedule. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so it's not always just a pure math you know, problem. X number of students by X number of teachers equals this class size and it should run that way. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, why that is. Uh, in April, we look at it for overstaff, what are reduction in force, the work of education act, uh, reduction in force last month. Um, and we have until uh, the end of next month if we want to continue to do that. So we can look at it. Anyways, um, if we wanted to look at uh, or if we're overstaffed in the area of all of those we make those recommendations at that time. Obviously, with May, uh, we make recommendations to you as a board of education uh, to be included in the Five year forecast, and then we'll continue to monitor our enrollment throughout the summer. Um, I think what's important to note here is uh, we, we act upon the best information we have at a given time, but that constantly changes and can change. Uh, we, we just you know, take a move into the district with high special education needs. You know, one on one staff member that you know, they need to come with the student and they're not responsible. For example, with the preschool student right now, we've gone back and forth on whether that need is there. It's currently in the budget. Conversation today, maybe that's not going to be. So that would be something that we maybe feel that we can play. So, uh, but know that we're constantly looking at this and staffing can change over time. Um, and we are, I'll talk a little bit about kindergarten here in a bit. But kindergarten is one that always in June and July we're looking at, we're crossing our fingers, hoping people enroll, um, but it can be a late, late staffing change. So I just wanted to kind of point out to you that staffing is kind of an ongoing process that goes throughout the course of the year. Uh, That's one really of, helpful. Yeah. One of the um, obvious um, pieces of data that we're constantly monitoring and talking about is enrollment um, throughout the district. And we do, uh, about every five or six years, it's good practice to do enrollment studies, <coughs> look at birth counts, look at you know, methodology, and you know, trend in terms of enrollment. So this is just a graph that shows you fairly consistent uh, enrollment over time. We, we peaked in 15-16, we were over 2,000 students, and we dropped out uh, to around 1,500 students. If you look at the study that was done in the fall, uh, projections would lead you to believe um, that enrollment would dip into the 1700s and hold fairly steady, looking all the way out to 20 or 29. I know you all had that report, and you, you had an opportunity to look at the methodologies that we used to calculate enrollment. Um, I think there's some unique features about our school district um, that maybe make us a little bit different than other districts in terms of um, when students enroll. We don't see a little bit more enrollment in our immediate school potentially as a second family home purchase that we're in the community as an entry point. And we also will have a, uh, a bit of an increase going from eighth to ninth grade going to high school in that summer so that students over in St. Jones are in private schools. That's a number that we need to um, I do want to take a, a, a moment here to, to talk a little bit how we calculate. I think looking at enrollment uh, from K3, K3 perspective is, 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 is very um, fair to look at just a simple calculation of the number of students, the number of sections per grade level, and the points to the class size. So everything we're looking at um, this year is looking at between 19 and 23. Um, as a class size in grade. In grade four, we start to identify kids and we start to track seven on various tracks. So a pure mathematical equation doesn't make sense because you have a high number of students identified uh, for an advanced program, which would maybe increase the sizes of those class while other classes are lower, or vice versa. So it's not a good way to purely look at those. So when we do that, we need to run master schedules as the principals for honest with what those class sizes are coming out as. And you can see something, you know, if you look like you did a pure math problem, that's a, that's a class size of 21. Well, it might be 27 to 19. And that's how it plays out from fourth grade all the way to high school. So it's one of those things that um, just staring at the moment and doing math doesn't necessarily uh, make sense. So we go through that process with um, our intermediate, middle school, and high school principals as well. Um, one of the things that uh, you also may uh, not be familiar with or 
to get a little bit different need to be reminded about. Right. In our negotiated agreement, yeah. we yeah. had the opportunity to add a sixth instructional class to see mm -hmm. teacher at the secondary level. So right now, teachers are contracted for five periods. If we want to or we need to, we add a sixth section. That's done to either lower class sizes, maybe offer a program that 12 kids signed up for. We'd really like to run that class, but we don't want to hire a staff member who can do that. This year and in the previous years, due to the high level of enrollment in high school, we've offered a lot of sixth period classes. This year we offered 20 sixth period classes. If you take that over and quantify it in terms of FTE, that's four teachers. So as enrollment has increased, we leverage that to manage the student class sizes. So what's happening is, is enrollment's dipping, we're backing off on those number of classes. So if I'm a board member, I'm thinking, why aren't we reducing full teachers? Well, what's happening is we're reducing the number of six periods that we're offering. There is a cost savings to the district, but it's not as significant as the number of the The flip side of that is, for the last five or six years, when enrollment has been real high, we haven't had to add full-time so I think it's a really good deal financially for the district. It makes sense to the staff members that do it. Um, but that plays a lot into, as our enrollment lowers, maybe you're not seeing the reductions that you might have expected just from the community. Remind me, Bob, do you know how many will have a sixth grade next year versus this year? I want to say it's between 12 and 15. Um, so almost half. Yeah. So it's, it, it is dropping. I think it will continue to drop. Um, and those are usually first semester. Some of them are four years, some of them are first semester. So that's something to keep in mind. The other the other piece that we've already talked about is the uniqueness of our program in grades four through six. If we were in difficult financial times and we had to have some really difficult conversations, we would probably look at that program and say, okay, this is really a great thing to offer kids. We'd like to do it, but we need to level this thing off. So I'm going to pause there. I said a lot. Do any questions on enrollment or, or how that works? Just explain to you a little bit more about the six periods. So as like a teacher that's usually teaching on a full schedule, they're adding the six, they're pulling up more OT, going through the six periods. So it's kind of flexing their schedule. Yeah, so it's adding additional time, instructional time, same amount of time per day, um, but they're adding instructional time, which increases rating for that staff member. They're compensated you know, an amount for that, but by no means is it the cost if you were to take those 20, 20 additional periods and, and, and kind of play that out financially compared to what we had to pay to come in for staff. I believe in the current contract, I would think it 2000 I think it went to 2000 for this extra And you but approve those annually, they're not really So globally, you know, looking at, and I, I appreciate the explanation that I can't just divide 1772 by the number of students, but as you look at this trend, which is clearly a little bit of a downward trend sure. in enrollment, do you see um, a downward trend in staffing that, yeah, that I would say, accompanies this? I would say more the elementary than the secondary. I think you will see a lower number of assistants. Secondary, and if you know, I wanted to talk about kindergarten tonight. But if kindergarten stays below 100 students, right. you're going to see reductions almost annually. Some of that hopefully happens through attrition, you're not lifting people, but we've done some of that over the last you know, five years as well. There has been some attrition in the industry. Um, but hope, you know, that if the five sections becomes the norm, five and six, you're going to see some reduction. So that's beneficial, but if we're talking a difference of around 200 students, that's a lot to be in just at the elementary level. And I wonder, I, know, I think you've talked to us before about class sizes and when you would consider not running a class. For example, in high school, if you only had six students that wanted, you may have a, a cutoff that you have generally um, kind of come to understand makes sense when not to run a class. And then that could potentially make a difference even at the, at the upper level. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we 
been in a position where, you know, and a lot of things play into that. So if, uh, if, if you're adding a new AP course or a new program, you expect probably to learn more than as, as it starts. And you may, you may have a few years where you stomach low numbers to let the teacher and the kids grow the program. There then becomes a point where we hey, just don't have enough kids pursuing this and stuff not being more this world. And I've seen you combine things, like yeah. French, I think it's going to be combined next year, so that it's, the students don't get the offering, but, you know, we're not paying for another teacher to do that. Um, but it's something I think we need to keep our eye on, um, the demand for the classes, because we have been increasing the number of classes available to our students, and if, with fewer students, I mean, clearly you're going to have fewer students sure. in each of those classes, and so sure. we have to I mean, that, that logic on six periods on the pool will sort of fall Right. We started the captain, we had eight or ten years of our students. Right. The point is in production. So, well, no, 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 of course, one year and not the next. So right. we're only going to offer, you know, AP, whatever. Every, as long as you have a teacher who can, you don't hire right, right. Let let go a teacher every year. But, you know, right, that's a good. There are lots of ways I think to get creative about doing it, and well, I'm really looking forward to hearing more from you on that. Okay. I just want to walk through um, the recommendations that we're looking at. Uh, when we uh, transitioned to how the Spring Home Intermediate School for the construction project, we felt that we were able to staff um, the learning building for the park staff on this campus. So we did not, we did not replace that position. We were actually able to make nutrition at that point. So we have not had that position the last two school years. We're obviously recommending that we bring that position back to the So we um, dedicated to that building um, for the school day. Uh, we are looking at globally um, aid coverage. We, you know, Lisa does a great job with principals doing kind of an analysis of our aid, and Chris is involved in that process as well, um, ensuring that you know, the, aids, uh, the needs of the students and the staff levels are appropriate. Uh, the uh, I guess net net on all of the aids is an additional one and a half hours, um, and that will be added to the current aids contract, and that is more about the library. Space. Uh, space is so, uh, that recommendation uh, is, is also there. Uh, I included an EMIS coordinator on here uh, just to remind the Board of Education. Uh, I'm not sure everybody was on the board at the time. We had the EMIS director meet roughly. At that point, the uh, contracted services were up to the CA to help us support those services. We're able to kind of stay afloat in that area. We replaced and hired the secretary, administrative assistant, and the assistant superintendent. Um, and over the last you know, six or eight months, we've been training her in the services um, and we've backed away from the contract that I'm supposed to be So we want to bring that position back into the district. I think next we will actually see the same as we can get for administrative assistant. I think Chris just said the study of the salaries that we're looking at don't make sense in terms of the responsibility for that position. Um, so uh, that would be posted and filled. And who's Lisa's new assistant So <laughs> Who's going to help Lisa? It's the same person. Okay, so she'll still do it, but well, that's great. Um, mental health services, we've talked about this as a Part of our instructional audit a year ago, we had 18 recommendations that we were going to uh, mental health services uh, at that time. Uh, we felt and we took those to the district leadership team a year ago and said to help us prioritize these things. They felt there was a huge gap in mental health services. So we the course of the last year in identifying creative ways to, to bring these services uh, to the district. This is not something we would approve in terms. I don't know if there's anything you want to talk about specific to these services or mentions that we would. Well, I think that they're vital to the implementation of the key 
EIS framework. They'll serve uh, to support students in that uh, in the targeted and then intensive intervention um, response on the pyramid. Um, both, as Bob was saying, we're going to recommend doing the uh, contracted services, not hiring a person. Uh, what I like about that is that we can evaluate how it's going. Um, also, both <coughs> agencies are allowing us to interview and find the person we feel is a good fit for our district. Um, so it's not that someone is just going to be placed here. We have some say so in that. Um, we've been shopping for contracts uh, for the school-based mental health provider, and we're getting really close to making this selection. So again, this is a number that uh, can be included in the budget. One of the agencies we're looking at currently already provides us with that emergency crisis management team, and so that would be a really nice fit. Um, a second agency already has uh, a connection with us as well, so I don't think we can go wrong either way. Um, the next recommendation, we currently have um, one and a half ELA coach, I, I know you back in February had a full presentation um, from Nancy Kevin and from Barb Sands um, on instructional coaching and the capital that I had in our school district. I have shared that information with you. Um, I think the, the, the benefit uh, in terms of what we're trying to do instructionally for our school district um, is, is, is there. Back at our instructional model recommendation through the ground instructional coaching. We had this conversation a year ago, and the decision was to go that one made more sense and from a budget perspective for all the year. So we are bringing that recommendation back around. Um, but I think just back in, maybe if you want to give a few comments on what your, your, your thoughts are on the math and how that has gone this year, um, aids for ELA. Well, I think uh, during your presentation, you really kind of illustrated all the benefits of both Nancy and Barb. Our, Barb's been incredibly helpful with the rollout of the new bridges and band program across grades K through five, but she's been incredibly helpful in grade six as well, too. She's already on top of um, creating a website right now that will um, be a math website for teachers as well as for families to access. Um, she's already diving into work with principals to identify what are the goals in each building um, for her work for next year, but we already know she's going to spend some time on common assessment development um, and continuing to bring new teachers on board, new teachers to uh, different grade levels. We have a couple teachers training 
transitioning into math for the first time or into a new grade level, but she's already set up meetings to train those teachers over the summer. So it's really nice to have a person in that position that has the flexibility to really kind of meet teachers where they are. Um, so it would be awesome to have that assistance in ELA. Um, I feel like ELA, because ELA skills cross disciplines um, and be able to read and to write across disciplines is so incredibly important. Curriculum cycle next year begins our um, cycle for ELA doing and refinement, so the timing would not be more perfect. Um, so, ready to go. Is there a point of diminishing returns with these coaches where you know we're not rolling out a new curriculum? They've been here, they've had the time to implement their bag of tricks. All the teachers are sort of more consistently. Uh, implementing the subjects the same way, with the same depth, and I, I mean, I would, it, or, so. Well, I, I think um, it's very similar to an athletic coach that you can always use coaching. You can always, there's always room for improvement. We have had new tests, new things, you know, that we're faced with, new mandates from the state that we're faced with that we have to deal with. And there's new expectations on our students, you know, post-secondary as well. That I feel like there's enough that we're constantly growing. I feel like um, after the year of adoption and redoing curriculum maps and refining assessments, there's a lot of work too of just really pushing into classes and doing modeling, um, doing evaluations of teachers where they're not non threatening evaluations, where it's just giving them feedback for improvement. Um, Mark does a phenomenal job of that, so does Nancy um, modeling strategies for teachers to be able to use, giving them feedback. Um, it's very different, I think, getting feedback from them because they've developed such nice relationships with teachers where there's that trust, so they feel okay in telling Barb or telling Nancy, like, I'm not finding success with this. I need to come up with a better approach, whereas I think that if it's someone that is the evaluator or the principal, they might not feel as comfortable in making a statement like that. That's what I'm going to do next week. In absence of a coach, whose responsibility is it to provide this type of coaching? I think what you know, we have to realize is that there's a lot of mandates for just taking T tests. That's the first part of the teacher evaluation system. The requirements that has placed on the principal is taking them away from some of the Now, it's not that they're not doing that work and they're not having those conversations. Then, as well as teachers, and their ability to time. If, if you, you know, if, if you went through the ETS process, the amount of time teachers have to spend just to do the paperwork on the front end to prepare for an evaluation is hours and hours and hours. That is to put a mandate upon them that is taken away from their ability to do some things like that. Um, and I think instruction coaching is a well better model of research in terms of helping to I need to address or where is this at? And you could make an argument, sure, in every content I'm not recommending that they don't see that going into next year and hey, now the science counts. And the ELA, the reading side of things, crosses all kinds of areas, math as well, the science is, I don't see for we just don't we're not big enough to support that level of staffing. But this is a maybe this changes how we look at To me, it's similar to the conversation around 
moment of, I just don't want to lose sight of, yes, these positions are doing a lot of new things. They also have to be lightening the load a little bit on someone who is doing some of this. So then, you know, maybe I, I, we don't need as much. I would suggest to you that the plate has been <laughs> added to, to, to such a level in all of our offices. Um, a lot of it due to state mandates that it's not you now someone's you know, getting their feet up and someone just trying to get some work. Can I respond a little bit to that yeah. too? Um, I think there are some examples um, like where we were in that um, two adoptions ago to have two programs that were polar opposites as far as the approach and math is really a sign that if you don't have someone really looking at a picture that's across the district, things can really not be functional. Um, I think you had asked the question about well, what would we do if we didn't have that position. I had already mentally kind of come up with the plan B in the event that for next year, for this year, ELA rollout, we wouldn't have the benefit of having that person, and I would probably contract a consultant probably from Penn State or a local university that has a strong English department. Um, but the downside to that is that after the year of adoption, they fade away. They also don't know our staff and all of those examples that I've cited as far as mapping, as far as assessment development, as far as pushing into classes, and really being a help or support for teachers over time. Well, I'm looking at our two success stories right now as far as coaches, I think that's been, you know, their content mastery and proven experience has been really important, but their ability to connect with teachers and to connect with administrators too has been really, really critical. Um, so I, you know, I think if we get interested in candidates, I think that would, you know, I think it's easier for someone new to come in as an elementary teacher or as an English teacher into a position and kind of get their footing to go into a position where you're serving K-12 teachers that it's a challenge to develop in relationships with people. And I would just put out there from a budget perspective, can we help you with staff and bring it back on the I don't think you're going to have to be able to hire someone that's the possibility that we uh, go through a process and you know, we feel like we've got the right fit and that we can get to it. You know, that's, that is a possibility. Well, it, my husband used to say to me whenever I wanted to buy a new piece of furniture, think very carefully because it seems like furniture comes into the house and it never leaves. And that's kind of how I look at additional staffing. You know, we, we create positions, we fall in love with it, we become reliant upon it. Um, and so that's the caution that you're sensing is, I feel like this is a beautiful new piece of furniture that we've probably been needing, um, but the caution about once it's here, we may have declining enrollment, we may have needs to make cuts, and then we'll make it more problematic. But I know that will fall more on your shoulders, and as you're evaluating the effectiveness of this position versus potentially another position so that we can keep the budget in check. So, you know, I'm supportive of it, and I've seen the results, and I think that's great. That's just, just to clarify a little bit where my caution is coming from, and I, I know you sense that responsibility as our, as our superintendent. So. Um, a couple of just additional things. Um, we, we had three retirements in the district. I think the board has added up two of those retirements thus far. Um, have a retirement that's in the cap and set from a, a, a threshold of what we're looking for to have experiencing savings based on those two individuals. It's not as dramatic in year one um, as a severance piece of those that are in the retirement. So I don't want to oversell that to the board. Um, but there are some savings there that we can play out the board can't just put from a budget uh, perspective. I also want to bring to your attention the kindergarten enrollment. It's the bait of my existence. Um, it's currently at 88 students, 84 currently registered for potentially registering. Uh, we scheduled the 
had seven sections. We scheduled uh, to go to six. Um, I've kind of targeted mid-May. If we're not at 100, we would consider looking at alternatives to um, uh, higher the district. And what, what that means is if we're targeting the social studies to be free, then we're targeting up to print, maybe we consider doing some more than maybe in those positions and cutting back to five sections. And, that could play out to be a great move by the superintendent that would save us money. It could play out in yeah. July and come back to you and say <laughs> that was a complete failure and we need to hire. So I just want to, I want to you know, put that out the radar. That's what we're going to do. How much of the spending in the environment, or does any of the spending in the environment moment continue to the trend within parents to pull back or send? Or, like, do we see bubbles go from one year to the next? You know, so I have a very personal um, uh, conversation going on around this whole back piece, and it's, it's becoming a you know, A lot of um, parents are just making that decision to hold back their children and actually contribute to try to get the number up and send it <laughs> um, this year. But I, so I, they don't even go to kindergarten screening then. Right. Just they, just, they just sit back. And you know what might, might, and I think this is all. Maybe some people are wrestling with that conversation all the way in the summer and then make decisions to set or to keep. So I, I don't understand it. Um, I wish maybe one of the things we need to look at is marketing and educating our community on what position this puts the district in. So hopefully we can do a better job of being able to register. Um, it would be great to have a conversation what they're hearing from parents along those lines and maybe we could help you get on the same page with them about yeah. setting up. We, we share information. We have some great preschool to to the kindergarten and talk about one um, that we don't have an answer and it's never like 70, which is clearly five, or 120, which is or 105, which is clearly six. It's 84. It's like very little Is there a financial way to incentivize the decision? Seriously, it's something to think about. If you make a decision uh, by uh, May 30th, yeah. there's a 10% savings on your full day tuition or something. Proper sizing appliances. Yeah, like, you know, I don't think you have to incentivize with money. Well, we do with so many other things. You register by this date, you get yeah. you pay this, and we register at the last minute, we have to spend more to do things at the last minute. Something to consider. Okay. So that, um, and then the additional six periods we've already uh, covered. But what's next was kind of this idea of are you going to keep on for instructional coaches and kind of take content and it's like I this is a stop and evaluate these two positions and look at the success of that. So there's no new positions on your horizon for next May. Uh, just now, at this juncture, I'm not going to hold you to it, but right now it's not like we're going to be looking at new positions every year. I'm not looking next. for a science instruction coach next year. Okay. We are going to talk about strategic planning and where we're going to get the future of the district. So, right, so that could, obviously that could make some changes. But remind me, how many new positions did we have last year? Uh, we had the math, math, but ultimately it was one and a half, right? Right. And then you know, to, quantify, you know, to quantify this, I think the number was about $67,000 between what we've learned to take away and what we've added. So if you want to remember, right. that's the number. Is it that, that change? That's the next change. Okay. 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 I'd like to turn the meeting over to Ms. Lucada. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Can you hear me? <laughs> this is the opportunity to look at the uh, five year forecast and the update um, prior to the board's recommendation to act on it. Um, I, I do want to um, just stress that it's a May update, uh, it's a lot less than what you've seen. Obviously, the uh, 
forecast is prepared in October in the fall. And at that point, you're looking at the current fiscal year plus four additional years. Um, the May update is really an opportunity to say, okay, this year is about three quarters of May completed in the fiscal year. So where are we? Are we on track with what we were expecting? And um, where do we need to make some modifications? And at the same time, Obviously, we're having those conversations about budgeting for next year. So, um, Bob and I have had discussions about uh, is this a uh, forecast presentation or is it a budget presentation? Um, and then, really, at the May update time, it really can be combined. Okay? Um, so, we are in the process of planning our budget for next year. And I guess that's a good starting point. I have been involved in cabinet's discussions about staffing and, and everything that Bob went through uh, with you in his presentation. I've been able to cost out to include the budget this year. Um, because, and, and you'll see this in the presentation, because the largest portion of your expenditures are your personnel costs, uh, any budget process would need to start staff increase in personnel costs. Um, so coming in new to the district and obviously just filling a gap for you uh, in the transition between treasurers, um, it was still important for me to put my own lens on your staffing. Um, so creating a position control document to be able to determine what what staffing levels are in there now, what are those estimated costs for this year, and how does that look in your current budget and your current um, forecast. And then taking that, rolling it forward um, for next year. So the budget process started there with position control, and um, those estimates went into um, assumptions about fringe benefits that you'll see in this presentation, um, and then got to a level of conversations with each department to say, um, what are your budget needs for next year? And again, coming in at a time, um, you know, where, where we have an opportunity to do things differently, but obviously um, that will continue to evolve. Um, wanted to work with the cabinet members and say, um, what are your expectations for the budgeting process for next year? So one of the things that I heard was, more interaction and feedback. So what we did was we actually sent the Google Doc for the budget templates um, that cabinet members had previously received just on, on um, printouts. Okay, so this way they were able to have a spreadsheet online. So I thought that was more so we created a spreadsheet anyway. So this way they had a spreadsheet. Um, they were able to plan thoughtfully about the uh, items that they had in the past. They were able to uh, make assumptions for the future. They were able to uh, insert additional comments that Bob and I can do. So um, we are, Bob and I are just starting that process now, um, looking, at the, <coughs> looking at those budgets and looking at those comments. Um, it, it seems like it's been a very positive process. Uh, I got good feedback from everybody who worked in the document. Um, and, and I've had subsequent conversations with people too as they've been preparing it. So it kind of prompted people to either pick up the phone or come in my office and open up the spreadsheet. And so now we're both looking at it and, and we're saying, okay, what is this number? What is that number? Um, what are your needs going forward? And what I saw were administrators who were very thoughtful, some making requests and carefully justifying those requests for next year. And then others saying, um, you know, it actually amounted to less. Um, so there was some savings in there. So, um, you know, that was a very positive process. And I think when that came together with the staffing piece, uh, Bob and I had conversations about that and, and, and the additional staffing pieces that we put in there and some of the um, additional needs that we knew just why that needed to be in there. Um, it was very consistent with what the forecast already had going forward. So 
price expenditures for next year. So it, 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 to me, it was what comes first, the chicken or the egg, the forecast or the budget. Um, but I think what we saw was a very well planned out forecast that was created in the fall. Um, so your budget expectations for next year align with what your forecast had in there for next year. And you wanted to say thank you. That's very customer service oriented to go through that process and really listening to what could be improved and creating a process for the cabinet members. Um, I also have a question with regard to the staffing. When you ran your own analysis, did you see a difference in the numbers from the numbers of what we saw in the forecast from October? Um, it, it was very it's pretty similar. So I saw two things. Um, I saw the staffing piece really align with your forecast uh, for next year. And I saw the expenditure expectations for this year being on track to where we are at this point. So it was really prepared as of the end of March. Uh, so we were running reports of actuals as of March 30th, the last closed month, 75% of the way through your fiscal year, and then determining, okay, based on your budget, based on your forecast that lines up with your budget, are you 75% there? And in most cases, you were. And where you were, it was it, it evened out to something else. So okay. overall, you're 75% of the way through the budget. And it might be preempting you, but on the revenue side, um, we did have the county six-year update. I wasn't sure if those property value assessment changes had been incorporated in October, because it was right around the time that those had come out. Were they? And if not, are they now? I would assume they were May update. Let me go through all the Great. Let me go through all address revenue and expenditures separately. I do want to give you, though, that background on the budgeting so that you know that these two things do Okay. Um, you're doing a five-year forecast update because um, it is required by the state to do that update at this point. Um, so a few goals in mind for doing that. Um, again, just bridging the gap here between during your treasurer transition. Um, like Bob's slide, uh, it is important to uh, again remember that your your forecasting and your budgeting and your finances are not a once a year event or a twice a year event when you do your forecast. So similar to Bob's slide, um, know that this is an annual process and there are different milestones throughout the year that allow us to take a look at our, our progress financially. I wanted to put a slide in there to show you where you were in October. So here's your October forecast. Um, I guess I can um, address some of your questions here. The October, this, this is obviously a very high level summary of your revenues and your expenditures and then uh, what the trend would be as far as deficit spending each year and then your annual balances. Obviously, the key takeaways here are uh, your beginning balance, uh, your deficit spending, and then your ending balance as it progresses and what does it mean in the out years. Um, I think um, you're not going to see a lot of change. Uh, if I go to the next slide uh, with your May summary, uh, you don't see a lot of change between the October and the May, um, but I will break down some of those changes. As you mentioned, the board has taken some actions this year that have impacted it uh, that really did need to be included. But for the most part, the uh, assumptions were consistent with the October. So as far as the uh, real estate updates, those sort of uh, assumptions that are built into your forecast other than the board's action to remove a designated inside village to permanent improvement, the assumptions were not changed. So your assessed valuations remain the same. The district has um, access to a financial software package called EFR uh, that treasurers commonly use. 
those that run those simulations. So it actually brings down all of your classes of property tax. Uh, we probably just say it's your, your property tax valuation. Your valuations are divided into several segments um, that you've probably seen over time. Um, and again, in October, you would work through all of that. So the software would break down your residential and agricultural uh, property valuation versus your commercial versus your public utilities versus your property. Um, each of those are going to grow at a different rate, um, and they're going to be taxed at a different rate. So you want to put different simulations in there for each one of them. Um, you would typically do that in October. You wouldn't necessarily change that in May funding unless there was a significant <coughs> um, And we had previously talked about the estimates that uh, are included in your May update for the uh, inside millage. When we talked about the estimated amount of that 1.5 millage, again, we had um, some updated numbers on what the evaluation actually is for this year. Um, so that number may have been a little bit more accurate. And then again, what the estimates were in the out years. Um, but that was one lump number, so we were taking one combined assessed valuation. We weren't necessarily breaking it down per class of property. Okay, um, so that doesn't have that level of detail in the May. Do you have a sense of it? I didn't ask you this ahead of time, so I don't want to be on the spot here. It's definitely back to this. Um, I wonder if sometimes how overly conservative we are about our assessed valuation work as I look at these forecasts, and it'd be interesting to compare um, the last five to ten years on what we had in there. We want to be conservative, but not so conservative that it's really skewing our ability to know what our revenues are going to be. So um, I don't know if you have a sense of that, just from what you've looked at, or if you <coughs> as a board ask. You know, just a general comment. I think most districts are very conservative in their uh, assessed valuation estimates. Um, they're always going to be conservative, um, and especially since 2008, because I think every community saw what the recession in 2008 did to their property values. And some communities have recovered faster than others. And I've seen economic updates um, that have said, yes, we're recovering from 2008. Have we completely recovered yet or not? And then if we have or have not, how does that set the trend for how we're going to recover in the future? So since 2008 happened, uh, maybe you've seen a greater uh, increase in property valuations uh, because we're in a recovery. But once that recovery levels off, you may not see those same percentages again. So uh, there are a lot of experts yes. that advise treasurers. Um, I was just at the OAS phone conference last week, uh, attending those economic updates and watching those presentations of trend lines and, and property tax valuations and receipts and, and that sort of thing and how it plays into the general economy as well. So um, that's really a study in itself. <laughs> I would just like to add, we have to remember that even though our property values grow, our assessed value can grow since we're pretty much residential and we're subject to House Bill 920 except on the inside mills or new construction, that our revenue doesn't hardly grows. But it, when we do a new levy, it affects what we would expect our seats to be on that. So it's important. Right, but we, but we don't put a, a new levy. You can't put a Not new levy in focus. But, but I'm saying your assessed value changes does not. It doesn't impact you year to year. Right. Anyway, um, so that's a study in itself. Um, and you can break that down into a lot more detail. There is software to assist your treasurer in doing that. So I suspect that in October uh, 2019, you may see a more detailed breakdown of this. Um, but for your May update, I'm showing you a summary. Um, I do have some additional breakdowns on this, just for my own clarification, um, to get up to speed on your district. So, um, and, and that'll be provided with the um, assumptions that follow the five-year forecast. Again, another takeaway from your five-year forecast presentation is always the fact that 
your district is heavily funded from property tax. And so that's why that's such a key area to discuss and keep track of. Um, you're correct in that we're going to have to buy that house bill by 20, so you don't see great fluctuations in uh, property tax each year. And then um, the other areas of revenue include public utilities, the unrestricted grants and aid, the restricted grants and aid, the property tax allocation that's a reimbursement from the state, and then other operating revenues that include your kindergarten tuitions, your interests, um, any number of additional things, rentals that come into the district. Um, your next slide so, uh, breaks down those general property tax. So uh, that shows you the assumptions for each year of the five-year forecast, the year-over-year -year changes and the year-over-year -year, uh, percentage change. A couple of things to note on that. So you see a big decrease between 18 and 19, and I think it's been brought up in several presentations that fiscal year 18 saw changes to the federal tax laws that um, encouraged property tax owners maybe to make their property tax payments for calendar year 2018, uh, in calendar year 2017, which is still fiscal year 2018, um, so that they would get an additional benefit under federal income taxes. So um, I, I think what this district saw was a lot of folks making an additional payment that would have otherwise fallen in fiscal 19 in fiscal 18. Uh, so that's why you see a, a pretty sharp decline from fiscal 18 and fiscal 19. Um, there was an update, so there was actually uh, probably a higher assessed valuation in those years, but I think it was a tiny issue. Uh, you're also receiving revenues from two counties on two different schedules, so uh, again, I think that's a tiny issue. Going forward, um, in fiscal 20, you see a, a slight increase um, but then from 2021, 22, and 23, what, what that reflects is that shift in those inside bills to permanent So if you break that number down, you would see a decrease while your property tax receipts are going up and your AV is going, as a result of your AV going up, you're actually taking out about $800,000 starting in 2021 and setting that aside in a separate fund. Your forecast only shows general fund receipts and expenditures. So the district obviously has a number of other funds uh, that work independently of all that. So you don't see that reflected in this forecast. So the revenues are going down slightly, but the expenses are also going down. It's not transferring out. You're always two slides ahead. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let me get there. Um, and that bill was about 800K. Eight, 850. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that is somewhat half more year collection. So you see a half year collection in 2020 because your January 2020 collection will actually reflect that, which falls in fiscal 2020. Um, but your uh, July and August 2020 collections are actually fiscal year 2020. The next piece of revenue worth mentioning is the unrestricted grant and aid number. That's your state funding for um, your unrestricted state funding. There are a few other pieces to state funding but this is primarily what people refer to as your guarantee. So how much, so if the guarantee, if they got rid of the guarantee, the Patterson plan for our district, does all 1.8 go away or how much of that? The Cuphead Patterson Fair Funding Formula, I had a presentation on that last week as well, um, is attempting to simplify uh, and correct it so that more districts, it applies to more districts. Because by referring to a district as a guarantee or a cap, uh, which is the opposite of a guarantee, um, is indicating that when we put you on the formula, 
it either generates not enough revenue to compensate you for the number of students that you have in your actual operations, or it generates so much revenue that the district couldn't be funded. So those are the districts that are capped. Um, so they tried to correct the formula and get more districts uh, on the formula, I guess. About 16% of districts still would not fall on that formula. Chagrin Falls is one of those 16%. So we would still have a guarantee. Uh, the state would still offer a guarantee, uh, guaranteeing at least fiscal 19 receipts. And then um, that would carry through the next binding, so fiscal 20 and 21. And um, it looked like it made sense. I mean, that, that's what happened with Chagrin Falls. Uh, the, the formula, the new formula didn't apply, um, and so we were here to. But the removal of the, the guarantee, guarantee would be how much before, could that's definitely back. I would say there's a little bit of a fight with this budget that's going on. The governor has one interpretation of the revenues. Uh, the Senate Finance Chair has a totally different. That's a Cup Patterson in entirety is not going to get it. It's just not going to happen. I'm trying to run that. I'm trying to get a sense of what they actually want to try to. Um, but he, he, Matt really understands what we're talking about. And he's going to have to get it. So I think that we're safe in talking about it. So that this 1.8, maybe I didn't ask the question, this 1.8 includes other specific, like student specific title funding as well. It's not just. Or is that just the money that we received? Do you know what I mean? The funding. unrestricted grants and aids uh, made up of four different pieces of funding. So it's your formula funding, right. so your guarantee. Um, there's two uh, pieces of that state funding that are considered below the line. Mm -hmm. um, and those are allocations for preschool and special education transportation. So how much of this is the formula of our most of it? Most of it. So if I'm looking at fiscal 19, uh, almost 1.7 million or 188 is formula funding. Your preschool amount is $43,000. Your special ed transportation number is 55. And then the other piece of it that comes in separate is your CDL funding, which is about 100. That is a good question. I have one more. Okay, Perka Patterson, can you elaborate on why Chagrin falls outside of that? Sure, I just totally fun. The 16% of districts then, is it because they would be underfunded? They, so they still needed a floor? Yes. Okay. That's what the so guarantee we've got is. So we got so much less on Cup Patterson that they'll keep us at the guarantee. Yes. Right. The okay. guarantee is the floor, and the cap is the ceiling. They're using two measures. They're using property values and income. And we kind of it didn't that. help us. <laughs> it didn't help us. So um, I guess I gave you the detail on that unrestricted grants and income um, through those questions. And then uh, again, looking at your expenditure, so the other half of your um, forecast, your, uh, like I said, your expenditures are primarily personnel and benefits, and that's going to be in the district, so um, close to 80%. Your purchase services, supplies, capital, other objects, um, those are really those budgets that I talked about and you how know, we put those together. And uh, again, purchase services is a big chunk and it's worth mentioning, but the district doesn't have a lot of control over some of those things, um, the, how the district tuition numbers. Um, some of them are, are, are deducts from the state, so we don't even get the but we report it as an expenditure um, each month on our settlement statement. Some of them are our contracts that we and I think through my conversations with the cabinet members on their budget, their department budgets, they were very thoughtful in planning those. So I would say that that number is very accurate. Um, they're very thoughtful in when they plan those contracts and estimating increases and getting as accurate information as possible before they make the budgets. So um, I'm confident in that number. And the, um, our health care expenses fall under. 
Employee benefits is a separate category in the states. Funding. Is that all healthcare? No, it's not. Um, the district is required to pay a share of an employee's retirement system contribution. So an employee contributes if you're classified 10% if you're certificated 14% of your own pay to the retirement system. The district is required to provide a 14% match for both certificate and classified. You might not have this information on me right now, which is fine, but I would love to know um, from last year to this year what our health care expenses actually looked like and if we've changed in the forecast moving forward because we're hoping to see some savings. I know that that was incorporated in October. That was part of the update. But yes, it's um, good to revisit to see if we're achieving more savings than we yeah, I can, I can tell you that that was, and that was called out in your assumptions as well in the fall. Um, so it was noted that those plan design changes that were negotiated last year would come into play beginning October 1st, 2018. And so they were considered this year, beginning this year. Um, and it, again, when I, when I reviewed the budgets and the status, it was right on them. So what you had predicted is where you about, is about where you are. Um, going forward in the budgeting process, I think that the easy assumption to make is that it's going to go up 6% a year. And that's what your partner uh, in Arthur Gallagher tells you they help us manage our, our benefit packages. And that's the information that they provided. They met with me when I got here and they told me it's 6% increase a year. Um, but I think it's important to remember too in your forecast and specifically in your budget, if you uh, want to be as accurate as possible, but that change actually starts October 1st. So uh, in planning your budget, what I did, I took the approach of there's one rate for three months, there's another rate for nine months. Well, that, that six is a lot better a couple of years ago than that one was 12, you know, so. And Slowing growth. the growth is good, but we want more savings. <laughs> but the other piece of that too is um, about, so if you look at that benefit number and it's um, about $6.3 million, uh, 3.5 million of it is your medical dental health insurance. Uh, the rest of it is your retirement share contribution. You're required to pay a small portion, uh, a matching share of your employee's Medicare tax, and then you have workers' compensation. So on top of salaries, the cost of benefits is um, what percent is about 40 percent? Is that too much? Um, well, it, it depends on the employee. Right. So the standard amount that we, the base amount we would budget for anybody would be 16 percent. 16. Because that's your 14 percent retirement, and that's a 1 percent Medicare, and about a half a percent of um, dental uh, uh, workers' comp. Okay. So you would take 16 percent. Then it depends which medical plan the so if they take family, it's considerably higher for the district share than if they take single coverage, or some of them opt out, or many of the part-time or, or um, you know, not eight-hour day people if, if, if they don't take the plan or whatever, or they pay for the and, and I know you have to have all those details. It's probably your staffing chart, <laughs> so you can know exactly. But globally, it's about 16, 17 percent, or if you want, I'm not seeing the dollars here. Uh, it's again it's a percentage of of which health plan the person takes and how much they pay. So if I'm a but I'm saying as a as a percent of our as part of our overall budget, our global budget, we have X dollars for personnel and then X dollars for benefits. What percent is that? Uh, three point five million to twenty million. Uh, but not at the time. No, I mean, but that's comparing to the whole pie. Right, right, but okay. it's around 55% was 20, so yeah. That's what I was trying I was actually a little surprised. I thought it would be higher. I'm going to look at the portion of my favorite cost. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
way it was 36% better than the proxy. As opposed to just 16% on the proxy. Yeah. Um, the other thing to consider too is when I do the budget, um, if you were hiring a new employee, I would always put the maximum benefits in. So always assume that you take the average than the average. So they just have to pay the maximum amount. Uh, like Bob said, you know, for teaching positions, we would budget at a maximum of three, three years experience, maximum education level. Had initially put, had some conversations around even um, what level would the, the new custodian, head custodian, would come in at. Um, and then if it was an internal person, and how do you replace that internally and what level? So we did have those thoughtful conversations. Um, going forward, this is an expenditure. 2019 that lines up with your budget and it, it does line up with your expenditures for this year. Obviously 2018 is an actual so that was your budget last year. Um, 2020 going forward uh, that is very near to the budget that Bob and I have been discussing for 2020. Um, we're not quite there yet. We have a couple departments to go, go through but we're very close to. So if you wanted to know what your budget for next year is it's, it's fairly close to that 32 um, and then I guess the other major piece, and, and you had mentioned it, um, the transfers out is the expenditure line that corresponds with the permitted improvements. Um, I guess the other thing I should have called out on the last slide was the uh, decline in the capital outlay numbers. But again, that was a result of reclassifying the cost purchases out of the general fund of people with improvements. So it doesn't mean that they're not going to happen, uh, it just lowers the whole bar. So that's what you see with the reduction in the operating transfers out as well. Um, and so, I'm sorry, is this only from the perspective of the general fund? Yes. Okay. So your forecast is only forecast in general. This is the added inside of village as far as like the total BI the spend or the total BI spend? We just have to enter into the budget so that the inside mill transfer doesn't add to what we have in the BI. It's still the same amount of BI. But my question is, so I would just, it, just to clarify what you were saying, because you're absolutely right, I reduced the amount of permanent improvement expenditures by the assumed revenue of the 1.5 The transfer out of the job. So where we were saying $850,000 was not open up 1.5 bills, so that's where I reduced your Year. That's the budget we had in October for permanent improvement. However, if you had the bus maintenance in the permanent improvement, wouldn't it have had to gone up by that much if you added it? Because now you have our budget for permanent improvement if you added the bus expenditures. The buses were moved out of your capital outlay line. But they were added yeah. to permanent. Then the money that was spent on them should also go with them.
Total number of that plus inside the millage. It's not inside the millage was um, the assumption of inside the millage for 2020 is four hundred. Offset by three hundred thousand dollars of buses and vehicles from the capital outlet. But the PI number was states. That was your initial permanent improvement transfer. Right. So it doesn't. So the PI number does not affect the bus. I guess the question is, when you say permanent improvement on this chart, is that the permanent improvement fund? Permanent improvement is a piece of your operating. additional lines okay. for transferring money. So this is the portion of the transfer out that is for permanent improvement, not the PI spend for the year. Like how much are we spending on the train lane spending for PI in 2020? Uh, like you said, by the inside mills. By the 
buses that we're taking out of the capital up. Great. Okay. We'll just let you scrap it from back to us. We'll do maybe if we could just focus on the PI number next month or next meeting. Okay. Yeah, just I apologize that there wasn't that's okay. the clearest slide out there. Yeah, um, I think the actual yeah, transfers out. Yes. I don't yeah, understand. Operating that. transfers out of one million seven. But that that was um permanent improvement is the vehicle transfer out. All right. It's okay. I think it'll be easier if we just get it all in one place and come back to it. But this was really nicely done and we really appreciate all the work you did with the staff and um, you know, giving us I mean it's very reassuring to hear that where we thought we were gonna be is where we're at. That's that's always a good thing. Is there anything else that you would want to call our attention to with regard to this analysis? I think those are the key points that you should, you should take away from. It, it's a May update, right? And I think you'll probably see something very different next year in October. Um, and then again, with the Finance Committee, I think there's another opportunity um, for more discussion around um, your forecast and, and some of those assumptions and um, what's in the there. And then just to clarify, I think I heard our superintendent say that the new positions that are being proposed tonight that the board will be voting on are included in these numbers yeah. and in the forecast. So that forecast will change if for some reason those positions aren't filled or well, <laughs> yes. It's not even current tonight. <laughs> Some more reservations. Yeah. Okay. That does. Thank yes. you, Ms. Luca. I appreciate that. Um, so next is consent agenda items. Can I have a motion for consent agenda item 7A through K? Any discussion? I'm sorry, second? Second. Moved by Mrs. O'Toole, seconded by Mr. Rankin. Any discussion on these? I just want to draw your attention to the Yes. 
Garvey? Yes. Mrs. Rose? Yes. Mr. Rankin? May I have a motion for superintendent's recommendation 8C? 8D. Second. Second. Moved by Mrs. O'Toole, seconded by Mrs. Rose. So I think we had a pretty thorough discussion about it earlier and you have a sense of what some of our reservations are. Um, I think as we talk about budgetary goals for the coming year, um, and as you're looking at enrollment and place in this country, we make some hard decisions with regard to um, filling these positions. But I, as far as improving the position, it's a good idea if we can manage it with the resources that we're trying to manage. So that's my only comment. Um, Thank you. 
topic and then invite board members to sit in those presentations with me. Um, these are the dates and times. These are the dates and times. So you can make them just let me know and um, then we'll put it on the information center and we'll present it to us.